Perfect. All right. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're having an amazing Thursday. Um, like I said, if you have any questions as we go, pop them in the chat. We'll try to get to them at the end. And I'm Erica. I work for AskVet as the community manager for the clubhouse. Um, and we have the lovely Dr. Marks here with us to talk about noise phobias. And I know I have some pets that have certain no noise phobias, one of them being the smoke detector. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in the group earlier on this week, we had a lot of members with noise phobias ranging from thunder to fireworks to the microwave vent. So I'm excited to dive into this. Welcome Dr. Marks and whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start. Well, thank you, Erica. And yes, this is a huge, huge issue that really up until recently, veterinarians like myself, we really didn't give enough attention to, I will say. Um, and if you can see in my background here, we've got Frank and Beans having a little bit of a <laughs> lunchtime romp for your viewing pleasure if you uh, you're getting sick of seeing my face and want a little bit of a, some puppy love today. Um, but in the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to talk a little bit about what a noise phobia actually is. I think we use that phrase pretty casually, but really what it is, how we identify which dogs have them, and then more importantly, of course, how do we manage them and get our dogs, and as you see cats here, um, who can have noise phobias a little more comfortable. So most importantly to get started is we all have to be on the same page. What is a noise phobia? You might also hear a veterinarian or a pet professional call this a noise aversion. And essentially what this is, it's an exaggerated or excessive behavior because of a fear of noises. And as Erica mentioned, there are lots of different types of noises out there that can cause fear in dogs but about a third of the canine population is affected. So this is not a rare instance that we hear about, you know, your community is talking, you know, there's so, so many people who recognize that their dogs are not comfortable around certain things. And the problem is, is that we used to think that if a puppy heard a firework at the 4th of July and seemed really uncomfortable and anxious, that oh, well, if we can just get them through the night, they'll be fine, they won't remember it, they'll never have this problem again. But we know definitively from research that these worsen if they are left untreated, meaning if we ignore them and think they're just gonna get over it because the event's over and we seem fine, they should seem fine. Unfortunately, that is absolutely not the case and these dogs will have a worse experience the next time they hear that noise. The most common causes of noise phobia or noise aversions out there are definitely thunderstorms, anything surrounding bad weather, firecrackers, fireworks, those little poppets, you know, that kids do in the cul-de-sacs on 4th of July, all kinds of car sounds. And when I put in their cars, I'm also talking about trucks and motorcycles and um, horns that are associated with that, the beeping of reversing all of, you know, all of those different sounds fire trucks and police sirens, of course, but then there can be the inside sounds like you mentioned the microwave vent or the doorbell or um, the vacuum cleaner. There's, there's just a myriad of noise phobia um, triggers out there. And the, the key is, of course, understanding that your dog can be susceptible to all of them or just to one. Now, I know you're like, oh my gosh, don't put up a, a brain diagram, Dr. Marks, but this is really important because I want you to understand why these dogs suffer more as they age. So in our brain and in your dog's brain, there is this very, very small pea-sized gland that sits at the base of it called the amygdala. And the amygdala, essentially think of it as a Rolodex of every fearful memory that you or your dog has had starting at eight weeks of age. So that could be their tail got accidentally slammed in the door when they were running out of a room or they didn't get crate trained appropriately. And so anytime the crate door closes or a thunderstorm or a car driving by or a Segway or whatever it is, every time that dog has a memory that doesn't feel good to them physically or emotionally, 
there's a snapshot that instantly happens and that fearful memory is stored in this essential part of the brain, the amygdala. The next time that happens, so the next time there's a thunderstorm, the next time there's a noisy car, the next time the vacuum comes on, what happens in your dog and in your body is the amygdala all of a sudden says, hey, remember that felt horrible. You were really scared. It's happening again, watch out. And the brain becomes even more fearful which triggers this cascade of responses in your dog's body. And we'll talk about what that looks like in a second. But the problem is, is we can never erase those episodes. Once they're in the amygdala, they're there to stay for the rest of their life. So all we can do is try to one, not have them triggered and two, help your dog and you, if you have a noise phobia, desensitize to triggers at a very early age so that instead of your dog running into the next room and peeing because the vacuum comes on, they're like, you know, vacuum schmackum, who cares? I'm gonna go chew on a Kong toy. Um, so this is really important to understand and this explains why we should never ignore a dog who is scared, nervous, fearful during a noise event. Now, this can start at a very early age and that stinks, right? Because a lot of times when we have puppies at eight weeks of age, we're just trying to get them to not pee in the house, let alone desensitize them to noises and to really recognize their body language around all different types of socialization. But it's really important to know that this is not something that happens in dogs that are old. This starts young from three to 14 months at juvenile period is very important. But if you have a very, very young puppy, so less than five weeks of age, if you're raising a litter, you're taking in a foster puppy and you're starting to see signs of noise phobia, we absolutely need to hear from you right away. You need to talk to your care coach, talk to your veterinarian, because this is very unusual and often leads towards a really bad prognosis if we don't deal with it that young. It's even more prominent to see noise phobia in herding and working dogs. These dogs have very active brains and they sense and recognize sights and sounds and smells all the time. So unfortunately, if, again, if you do have a herding or working dog, they're more prone to having noise phobia. It does not mean that we can't treat them or give them high quality of life and help them deal with this. Now you might be saying, okay, Dr. Marks, you, you, I know it's out there. What would my dog be doing if they're scared of noises? So this is typical signs. Now there are other ones that are less common to see, but usually if you see this sweet little palm mix, um, we see signs of fear. So that's panting, pacing, trying to hide in different places, especially if they're new places in the house they don't like to go to, trying to escape. So if they're crated during a thunderstorm, they're digging at the crate, trying to bite at the crate, destructive behavior, chewing up shoes, chewing up furniture, scratching at baseboards, scratching at doors, and then fearful body postures. So again, this little sweetheart has a horribly fearful face right now. So essentially ears are back or even flattened. Eyes are very wide, pupils are wide, and you can see what we call sort of this like, um, it's, we call it a kind of a furrowed grin, but basically this kind of flat face lip where they're very, you can imagine this dog is saying to himself, I'm terrified inside. So these are all signs of noise phobia. And especially in dogs with thunderstorm phobias, we know that they can sense barometric pressure well before we know that storms are coming based on how things change and what their coat receives in their nervous system. So you may even be seeing signs like this in your dog when it's sunny outside. But two hours later, they're obviously scared of that thunderstorm, especially if they've had that phobia before. So how do we prevent noise aversion? Well, the first thing that we do, which sounds very silly and unrelated, but very much uh, an important part of this, is a selection of a puppy who is not shy. So if you are going to a breeder, if you are going to a shelter, a rescue, a foster group, and looking at a litter of puppies, or just an, an individual puppy and saying to yourself, how on earth can I tell if a puppy is shy or not at eight weeks of age? Well, there's some pretty significant cues that you can see um, right from the beginning. One, how does that puppy interact with the litter and you? Meaning most dogs that age, remember, 
have not had a lot of fearful episodes. So they should fairly comfortably approach you and sniff and, ex and basically explore their environment, meaning you. So they should feel comfortable walking up to you. They should feel comfortable sniffing you. They should not be the puppy cowering in the corner when the rest of the litter is playing or exploring with toys. They should not be the puppy in the corner when everybody else is having mealtime. They should also feel comfortable being touched. So if, this, if you're going to, especially a breeding situation, and you're exploring a puppy and you go to pick up that puppy and the puppy is squirming and whining and not wanting to be touched, that worries me a little bit because good breeders who are really worried about um, the good health of their lines and socializing puppies and getting puppies ready for their forever home have handled those puppies a lot, have had different types of people, different ages of people, different sounds. They've really tried to socialize those puppies and you, that should be evident to you when you go to see them. So those are important things. There is some controversy. I will say that I'm a proponent of believing that this is, this is true, but there's some controversy around if I can put a puppy on his or her back, that's a good sign, meaning that they feel comfortable enough to be in a very vulnerable position. There's some research that says that that's not necessarily the end all be all sign when you're picking out a puppy. However, I would say that is still a positive sign. If you can come to a puppy and the puppy goes on the back and you can rub all over the belly and give it a big raspberry and that puppy feels comfortable, that means that that puppy has had significant handling and socialization. It also means that that puppy is confident enough to go in a vulnerable position. So to me, that's a very positive sign. Now, if a puppy doesn't do that, am I telling you not to adopt that puppy? Absolutely not. But it's a, a bonus if you see that when you're going. The second thing we need to do is early socialization experience. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of things, just like with human children, that we should expose puppies to so that they're aware they exist and their sensory system can log it, process it, and figure out how they wanna feel about it. So that means handling, not just from the breeder or the rescue, that means you. So when a puppy comes home all day long, we should be handling that puppy appropriately. That means touching them in areas, especially of the body that are typically stressful. So that's ears, mouth, and feet. So when you're touching that puppy and, and rubbing, you know, sitting on it, they're sitting on your lap, flip, touching the pinna, so the flap of the ear, pushing it forward, pushing it back, you know, tickling inside, touching it with a gauze and letting that puppy know they are totally fine. So usually we pair that with a tiny little high reward treat, but we want to take anything that is potentially going to be stressful and immediately associate it with something positive. So whether that's praise or a high reward treat or brushing or massage or whatever your puppy gets really happy from, we want to take any of these positive, possibly negative experiences and turn them into a positive. So the first time the vacuum comes out, don't turn it on right away. Let your puppy, puppy sniff it and maybe get some yummy peanut butter. Smear some peanut butter on the top of that vacuum and let them eat it off or cream cheese or Cool Whip. And then as soon as you're ready to introduce the vacuum to your puppy, we don't want that to be an hour long process, right? We want that puppy in a safe space, the vacuum comes on, that puppy gets yummy peanut butter, who cares what the vacuum is doing? And then you turn that vacuum off and try it again the next day. We don't, when we're talking about socialization, what I don't want you to think about is deep immersion, meaning that, okay, I don't want my puppy to be scared of motorcycles. So I'm gonna put the puppy in a garage and turn a motorcycle on and leave it there for 30 minutes so it just gets flooded with all this noise absolutely don't want to do that. And I'll explain why in a minute. Okay. So avoiding exposure to traumatic experiences. This is sort of what that I was just referring to with flooding. If you know that your dog has thunderstorm phobia. So as the thunderstorms are approaching, your dog's getting that wary look on its face. He or she is going and hiding in a closet, jumping in the bathtub, pacing, panting, urinating, you know, it could be one or all of those signs. The last thing we want to do then is say, oh, okay, well, next Tuesday, there's a storm coming. I'm going to cancel my plans and we're going to go for a walk to the park 
in the middle of the thunderstorm and hopefully my dog is just going to sort of get over it. We know, remember what I was talking about with amygdala, that does not work. In fact, it makes things much worse because our dogs that have traumatic experiences will do everything they can to escape the situation. That means if you are outside in a thunderstorm hits and you purposely have done that, your dog could try to escape you, get out of the leash, get out of a harness, run across the street, whatever it could happen. If your dog is crated during that thunderstorm, what's gonna happen? They're gonna to try to chew out of a crate and break off their teeth. I know that sounds very dramatic. I see it as a veterinarian, many of my colleagues do too. So instead of avoiding, I'm sorry, instead of purposely placing them into these traumatic experiences, we want to avoid because we don't want to trigger. So during a thunderstorm, what we wanna do is have instead of throwing them into it, we do two things. One is avoiding what they can experience about the thunderstorm. So these dogs go into the innermost portion of your house, into a bathroom or a large walk-in closet or a basement that's shielded from that. We turn all the lights on. We give them really yummy food. We turn on sound machines or music or TV to drown out the sound. We close the curtains so they can't see lightning. And that's a good starting point. For a lot of dogs beyond that, we need to talk about some of the other treatments, which I don't want to give away all my thunder right away, no pun intended. But there are some extra steps and extra levels for where that's not enough for some dogs. The other thing we want to avoid is punishment. And I know all the moms and dads that are listening today, these aren't the ones doing the punishment, but unfortunately in the grand scheme of things, there are some pet parents who unwantingly and knowingly will punish dogs because of what they do during these stressful events. Meaning there's a thunderstorm or it's 4th of July and you had to work late and you, by the time you get home, you weren't prepared for it. Your dog has destroyed two chairs of a couch and eaten all your shoes and scratched at the baseboard for, to the point where it has to be replaced. That can be stressful as a pet parent to come home to. And we don't want to say, well, you're in your crate now, or can't believe you did that. Or whatever else has been known to be punishment for dogs. Dogs, again, just like when you are in a fearful moment, your body cannot stop the response it has. It's just like if you're in a panic attack, which is essentially what these dogs are feeling, your body cannot stop your reaction, your physical reaction. A lot of that is your autonomic nervous system. You have no control over it. So we cannot punish what their body already has set in motion to do because their brain feels fear. Punishment only worsens the fear and punishment makes them not trust us, the pet parent, and we cannot be as helpful the next time. So definitely avoid punishment as much as you can. This is probably the hardest thing to do as a pet parent, and I've been guilty of this as, as much as anyone. It's, it's hard to stop. But what we don't want to do is console our dogs when they're afraid. That sounds really counterintuitive, right? Like why, when a, when a child's afraid, we rush to them and scoop them up and try to you know, sol give them solace. But what we are doing essentially is we are reinforcing a fearful feeling. Meaning that, and this, let me kind of walk this through. If your dog is scared of thunderstorms, and is doing some fearful behavior. So let's say they're um, cowering in a corner and pacing and panting. What will end up happening is if we go over and give them what your dog feels as praise, right? We're touching them, giving them attention. Your dog will fear that feel that that fearful response is how they should feel. Meaning that their body basically got reinforced that when it's thundering out, my body should feel fear. I should pace and pant and have um, accidents in the house and destroy shoes because mom or dad rewarded me for it. It also can lead to codependence, meaning that your dog then senses that oh, thunderstorm, I got to go to mom or dad. That's the only way I can feel better. And we may not always be around for that, especially other noise, uh, other noises that can cause aversion. We want to be able to teach our dogs independence. And as I think our next, the next time I'm on with you guys, we're talking about settle mats. And that is a great way to teach your dog independence in the home. 
So we also want to make sure that this statement, this, this sounds silly, but this statement is incredibly important. We don't want to think that if we don't console that we are somehow not being good parents and we're letting our dog be afraid. It is not teaching that at all. In fact, we're teaching the opposite. We're teaching them every time we give them praise, whether we're calling their name, smiling, giving them pets or snuggles, any kind of fruit reward. The, the times we do that is when we are rewarding good, positive, and wanted behaviors in our dogs. So that could mean a sit when they're not supposed to. We catch them in a down when they're, we, they didn't even know we're watching. We catch them settled when we came home from work. All of those things are wanted behaviors. Do we necessarily want a fearful behavior? No, we know that the body is going to do it. But we're again, we're trying to teach them to understand different coping strategies outside of that so that when we do praise them, they know that's the behavior they should be doing, if that makes sense. So how do we treat it? Well, I mentioned some of those steps right from the beginning of puppyhood. However, you may be adopting an adult dog or a senior dog and may not have the advent of from eight weeks on, right? Those may all already be established. So the first thing that we can do, like I mentioned with thunderstorms is minimizing sights and sounds. I love white noise machines. If you don't have one, it's such a great investment. Just go on Amazon and get one for your home. It's great for crate training. It's great for travel. It's great for any of these noise phobia trainings. If you don't have one though, a noisy fan works great unless your dog is scared of wind. So if your dog is scared of fireplace drafts, I wouldn't use a noisy fan because that's very similar feel to them. Otherwise, it's a great thing. Classical music, if you're a cat lover out there, reggae is wonderful for cats, but they love that. So, but playing classical music is great. And then blocking out the site. So closing the blinds, keeping them in an eternal room, staying clear of windows, staying clear of drafty doors, um, remember that we don't want to also have um, any kind of connection to the outside. So don't go in a garage, don't go in um, any kind of walkout basement. So again, the most internal part of the house that is accessible for both of you. And then, like I mentioned, there's a next step. Compression garments are a huge favorite of mine. There's lots of different ones out there. I'm just cut, putting three up here. Um, I'm sure Erica can maybe send links to people a little bit later, but these are wonderful ways to simulate swaddling in your dog. Now you might be thinking, my dog hates it when I come and smother them with love on the couch. This is a little bit different thing. So basically what this is doing is the compression of these garments stabilizes the nervous system. So their peripheral nerves, right? Like, so if you get goosebumps or you kind of get like, you know, like your hackles up if something's scary to you, those get calmed down and they don't get continually activated by a trigger. So they have one experience, the compression goes on, it calms them down and their nervous system can't keep activated, can't keep firing. The key to these though, is they have to be placed on at least a half hour before the stressful event for them to work. And then you gotta take them off when the stressful event's over. So if it's fireworks on the 4th of July, your dog might wear this for six hours. If it's just to go to the dog park, it might be 30 minutes. It just depends. It does not work though, if your dog is already showing those signs of fear and then you try to put the compression garment on, you'll be very disappointed. One added bonus, these are washable and you can put pheromones. We've talked about pheromones before, like a daptyl spray. You can put that on these and that it's just an added bonus of relaxation. And then there are some home therapies I want to suggest. I just mentioned the Adaptyl spray. There's also a diffuser. Remember, these are pheromones. These are natural chemical compounds that can relax your dog in the house. But there are also supplements that are super easy, like Zilkeen, which is a hydrolyzed milk protein. It has that very similar feel to how you feel after Thanksgiving dinner, eating a ton of turkey. So kind of that tryptophan relaxation. It's a great thing to add to your dog's uh, daily diet, in fact, if they are um, slightly anxious all the time, or if you notice they have lots of different noise phobias that are hard for you to control. Composure, very similar, L-theanine and thionine, which of these are 
amino acids that help to balance your body, your, your dog's brain, as far as how they recognize fear and triggered behaviors. So these are great things, again, that you can order yourself. These are natural, so you can add them in without having any kind of needed prescription. Um, and again, the more that you use, the more relaxed your dog will be. Now, finally, and I want to just make sure we have time for a few questions. If you've tried all of this, so you're like, I'm at my wit's end. I've socialized. I've desensitized. I don't console when my dog is it's fearful. I bought 16 different compression garments. We have our thunderstorm party in my, in my bathroom. My dog's on six supplements. I've literally exhausted everything. Dr. Marks, what do I do? Well, don't give up. <laughs> and if you have done all that, you are like pet parent of the universe, but there are some dogs that still need veterinarians to intervene with pharmaceutical intervention because the fear is so ingrained in their amygdala. And they've had so many triggered events that it's just not enough. Those natural strategies only do so much. So if there are some patients that we have where we need to encourage things like situational anti-anxiety medication or some dogs that need even more daily intervention. And remember, these are not, this is not a sign of you being a bad pet parent. This is not a sign that your dog has um, significant needs beyond other dogs. This is a sign that we are taking care of your dog's emotional health. And we love when pet parents call us and say, you know what, my dog needs more help. Uh, this is just not enough because we want to intervene early. Remember what I said? We don't ignore these situations. That's the worst thing we can do. Dogs don't just get over it. It just gets worse with time. So we wanna make sure that we intervene as early as we possibly can to make them feel a lot better. So feel free to contact me, contact Erica, contact your care coach, go work with your veterinarian. Lots more we can talk about with noise phobias, but if there's any questions at all, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing Erica. And I'll let you uh, ask away if there's anything. Perfect. No, that was, that was wonderful. I think thunderstorms are probably the most common with dogs. Um, I know my mom had experience with her one dog and it was a herding dog. And I never thought that that breed would be prone to it, but it was something that she developed later in life. So mm -hmm. that was the question is, is it something that they can develop as a senior dog? And is the protocol the same essentially for yeah. them? Yeah, that's a great question. And they can, um, it's more common to see it starting early. And I guess maybe I can answer this two ways. If you've had your dog your whole life and at eight years old, all of a sudden started getting fearful of thunderstorms, that can happen because maybe they had an episode that became fearful that you weren't even aware of, right? Maybe every time there's been a thunderstorm, you've worked from home, but all of a sudden now you're traveling and your dog was in a boarding facility and had a really scary event with a thunderstorm. We just don't know every event and we don't know how every dog feels about that. So yes, they can develop it. But what happens more commonly is, is maybe your dog has a fear of a noise that isn't common, right? So maybe it's um, the air and water show in Chicago is a common one for dogs. Jet planes are flying by. It only happens one weekend in August. So the first time it happens, people forget about it, right? Because it's now February and who remembers the air and water show in August. But all of a sudden we get a rash of calls in the second week of August. All of a sudden my dog is just crazy. My dog's running through the house and pacing and panting and I don't know why. It's because we don't remember that there might've been an, a random noise, but that dog's amygdala remembers. So the next time they hear it, you see them acting worse. And so that can be a reason that we see senior dogs acting that way. The other common reason, I guess I would think it's more common maybe now that I'm thinking about it than, than I remember, is that we as pet parents and veterinarians only recently realized what subtle signs of fear look like in dogs. So maybe the first time your dog hears a motorcycle, the only thing that happens is they go, hmm, I, I hear that, I, I don't feel great, but now it's gone and okay, I'm moved on. And we don't even notice what they did. Maybe they were slower to, and a little more deliberate. Maybe they crouched down a little bit. Maybe their ears just went from forward to the side. Maybe that's all they did. The second time they hear the motorcycle, maybe it's six months later, somebody driving by with a motorcycle, they're like, oh, I remember that. That didn't feel good. And maybe their ears now go back and their eyes go wide, but that's all they did. And maybe we didn't see that or recognize that as fearful. 
But then the third time the motorcycle comes out, then they start to pant. And maybe that's when we hear that panting and go, hmm, but we don't know why they're panting. So we just chalk it up to a moment and move on. The fourth time, so you see how I'm building, yeah. right? And that's a lot of times what we see with our senior pets is people come in and say, my dog was never fearful. But I bet if we look back to previous episodes, there were subtle signs we missed. And I'm just as guilty as that as, as you know, anyone. If my dog, Samantha is panting, I try to, in the moment go, okay, what could have been the trigger? What blah, blah, blah. But sometimes I'm with my three kids or I'm running late to a lecture or something and I'm go, okay, she's panting. I'll think about it later. But if we think about it in the moment, a lot of times it's helpful. Treatment is exactly the same. So we're putting them, we're eliminating sights and sounds. We're trying compression garments. We're trying natural supplements, getting your care coach or veterinarian involved if we need more help. Perfect. That actually makes perfect sense. Like you said, my dog has a fear of the smoke detector when the battery gets low. Yep. And I didn't notice it the first couple of times. And now she sits next to me on the couch and trembles until we fix it. So yep. that makes total sense. And she was like totally fine as a puppy. Yeah. So, yeah. Very common. And, and again, don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I tell pet parents all the time, we do the best that we can, right. With our human kids and our, and our furry kids. Um, but what I hope today has helped is for pet parents to kind of think about, okay, the next time one of these noises happens, I'm going to look at my dog and see what they're doing. Cause we can be again, proactive ahead of time. If all of a sudden, you know, you turn on Metallica and your dog's ears go, whoop, your dog doesn't like it. No matter how much you love that band, that would not be something I would play around them because it doesn't make them feel good. Right. Yeah. So it's just learning about your dog's emotional health and how we can make that as stable as possible. Perfect. Uh, another question that had popped up in the chat earlier on is about essential oils. Like, are there any essential mm -hmm. oils that are helpful to kind of calm them down during a thunderstorm or during fireworks? Any that you recommend, what to look out for, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So the same essential oils that humans use can have the same effects on pets. So typically lavender would be the, the okay. most common one that we use. Um, I caution using them, to be honest, um, unless nothing else has worked for two reasons. A lot of people will leave essential oils out and those can be toxic, especially if you have cats in the home, if they're ingested. So I get a little nervous with them being unsupervised. What I do like is to put lavender oil maybe on your dog's bed or bedding, um, around the food bowl, a favorite chair they like to hang out with, something like that and use the pheromone diffusers along with it. Okay. Because we know pheromones have research behind them, like the adaptive diffuser plug-in. Uh, it's gonna last for 30 days, so a lot longer than the essential oil. And there's research to show that it actually does calm the brain. Whereas essential oils, a lot of the research is, it might anecdotally work, like lavender might be great for you sleeping and it does nothing for me. Um, and so I, I try to stay away from things that I know are potentially toxic or unsafe because a lot of us, even in the most well-intentioned homes, we forget, right? And then we end up with a, a safety issue. Issue. So while I, I would say lavender would be the one I would try, I would be very specific about where it's used and I would not be putting out essential oils, poopery, any kind of um, anything that would sit out on a coffee table and emanate especially yeah. if you have cats in the home. Okay. And that brings me to the last question is, is that the same for cats? I know cats can be a little bit different than dogs, but they can still have noise phobias. I have one that anytime a sound, a loud sound happens, he like jumps and startles and sometimes takes off, which gets the whole house going with him. Yes. <laughs> so is the the same with cats as far as, you know, putting them in a room in the middle mm -hmm. of the house, everything's yep. the same. Yeah, so treatment is very similar. We're going to minimize sights and sounds. We're going to use pheromones. So the feline pheromone is feel away. Same thing, diffusers and sprays that you can put on things. Um, Zilkeen is great for cats. They have a cat version. Thunder shirts actually can be used for cats. You can use compression garments. Um, so all of those things are same. The veterinary prescribed for pharmaceuticals are going to be a little different. But again, that's a conversation for you and your veterinarian. But as you mentioned, cats don't typically pant. They can when they're stressed, not as commonly as dogs. But what you will see is flee. 
So cats typically become non-existent and you don't know where they are. Um, and that's because that's their innate response. I know we've talked about this on a different kind of conver lunch conversation, but when you see a cat hissing and swatting, that is the most fearful a cat can be. So it's rare to see that if it's just you hanging out with your cat in your house, it's rare to see them elevate to that level. But if they have escalated to hissing and swatting, that is the most stressed a cat can be. And we definitely don't want to interact with that cat physically. Like in other words, that would not be a time to try and pet your cat. You'll that's, that's where a bite can happen. So yes, hanging out with them in the bathroom, um, turning on reggae music, um, You'd be surprised, I, I, I hesitate to put these two together, but they end up always being together in my talks, is if you haven't tried, if you're a cat mom or dad out there, if you have not tried Meow Joanna for your cat, it is the best catnip out there in my opinion, and is a great addition to these bathroom parties that you might be having with your cat during a stressful event. So whether that's fireworks or a dinner party, um, like loud noisemakers on New Year's Eve, whatever that might be, um, that's a great time to let them chill out, put on some reggae, let them be in a place where they don't have access to all the sights and sounds and, and distractions, and then let them obviously come out when everything is over. So very similar, just a little bit different technique in regards to um, what we're looking for and how they react to stress. Yeah, and fear. of course. I actually have some of that catnip and my one cat loves it. So yeah, it's a bit, I'm a big fan of it for my patients too. They are, they definitely respond favorably. So test yeah. it out. Remember kittens are kind of hit or miss with catnip. It takes a little bit of time for their body to be you know, susceptible to it. So don't get discouraged if you have an eight week old kitten and Meow Joanna did nothing. Save it for a rainy day when they get to be teenagers. Love it. All right. Well, there, there are no other questions. Um, but again, if any of you have questions after this and you want to reach out to your care coach, please do so. Please reach out to me. Dr. Marks will be able to kind of help you out any way we can. And thank you again, Dr. Marks. We will be planning another time. webinar in January talking about safe space and subtle mats, which will go perfect with all of the changes that happen at the beginning of the year after new year's and things like that so yes absolutely we appreciate you thank you so much for joining us everybody and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day thank you dr marks my pleasure happy holidays everyone bye bye, -bye.